In chapter 15 of Matthew, he is speaking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, primarily the Pharisees. About 120 years before Christ came, there were people who wanted to see that the beliefs, the traditions that they had come to would be perpetuated. And since Malachi was the last writer of the Old Testament, 400 years before Christ, they felt themselves drifting on a sea. Jerusalem had been in trouble with Antiochus Epiphanes and others. Uh, many people had been killed. The priests had sold out to Antiochus Epiphanes. So these people decided that they would set up some guidelines. Now, they seemed harmless. We'll see tonight how that they have done this again. Human creeds. Next week, we will be discussing the human creeds of Protestantism. But tonight, the creeds of a few sects or groups and the creed of the Catholic Church. These people had set up a creed of about 120 laws and regulations. They called these traditions. And this is what he said, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesied you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So instead of teaching the doctrines of God, they taught the commandments of men. Now, Jesus condemned these Pharisees many times, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they observed strictly the traditions of men while violating the commandment of God. This introduces us tonight to several groups that you'll find appearing on the pages of history in the first four centuries. They have common names. Uh, each one means something, and the first group we'll notice called the Ebionites. The word Ebionite meant poor. These were poor in contrast to other groups. There were three different groups of the Ebionites, and rather than bother you with these, we want to just take the mainstream of some of their beliefs. They were a Judaizing group of people. By that I mean to say that, that they were Jews and that they believed that no Gentile could accept Christ and be saved without first becoming a Jew. These are mentioned in Acts chapter 15 verses 1 and 2, and it said that there were some that said, except they be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, they cannot be saved. Now, they were Judaizers because they were attempting to Judaize or convert Gentiles to the Jewish religion because they thought the Jewish religion plus circumcision provided salvation. And a Gentile without these could not be saved. The date of existence was, let's say, starting from Bar Kokhba, which was 132, who led the Jews in revolt against the Roman Empire for three years. They were put down in 135. These refused to unite with the Gentile churches from that time on. They kept to themselves and they believed, basically, that the Jewish religion saved. They attempted to combine the Mosaic ritual circumcision and the law with the messianic promise. Of course, Jesus came, they thought, to be a savior of the Jews. They were not really a sect in a sense. They were simply trying to combine both Christianity and Judaism, and in the process, they were neither Jews nor Christians. 
How would you classify these people? Well, of course, they are classified as Ebionites as a group entirely uh, separated from the others. They were the Judaizers that Paul mentions in the book of Galatians. They were a troublous people that followed Paul wherever he went. They went through Galatia and followed him to Corinth, and they bothered him in Rome. These Judaizers gave considerable difficulty to Paul in Corinth, and he wrote chiefly 2 Corinthians to refute them. Let us notice a group that probably should have more attention. They are called the Gnostics. Now that comes from the word that means I know, Gnosko, I know, the knowing ones. We mentioned this two nights ago that these formed the intellectuals of their day. They were quite an exclusive group, the knowing ones. They opposed the Apostle Paul and in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he mentions them. Science falsely so-called. Now that word science, of course that comes from the Latin word science, and it means knowledge or to know. And he uses this word, and the Greek word that is used from which the English has been translated is this word Gnostic. They were the knowing ones. But he said they are the knowing ones who are teaching falsehood. Now, we read two nights ago about these deceivers, these liars, and he's describing these very people. They were interested in the origin of evil. Now, you'll notice one thing that always is characteristic of, of false teachers. They are curious about the unknown. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us the secret things belong to the Lord our God and those things to which are revealed belong to us. There are some things that he does not want us to know. There are so many we would be incapable of knowing or understanding. But the things that are revealed belong to us. But man is not satisfied. He wants to complicate it. He feels that he has something more expensive if it is complicated and difficult to understand. There's one more reason. If something is simple, you don't need a teacher. You're not dependent upon someone to guide you. Now, if you wonder why Jehovah's Witnesses and others have a system that the man of the street cannot read from the Bible, I'll tell you why. You're dependent upon them for leadership. One thing you cannot do with the Jehovah's Witnesses is use a book over three years old and read from it their beliefs because they'll tell you, well, we don't believe that now, we've changed. Isn't that a strange thing? That people can change so quickly? If they were right, right the first time, they're wrong the second time, or vice versa. They're not the only ones, of course. That became the very heart of the Catholics. They had a complicated system that was dependent upon the priests, and the Bible eventually was taken away from the masses. And that's why we have the Dark Ages. Men did not have access to the book that gives light. Now these people were interested in the origins, and that became the basis of their beliefs. Dualism was the root of their beliefs. Persian dualism was one of the first, but man, for the most part, all the way from the ancient Babylons, from Nimrod on has believed in dual gods. Now, I think you can understand why. Uh, you feel real nice in the springtime and you see the roses blooming and so you say, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll uh, smell the rose. In the meantime, there's a buzzy in there, a bee, and it stings you on the nose. So to get away from the bee, you dodge and run into a thorn. So you see, there are two experiences. The pleasant smell of the rose and its beauty, and the bee and the thorn. So they looked out in the world and they said, there are things that make us happy, there are things that make us suffer. So there must be two gods. Now, of course, this was invented by the ancient pagans, so that most of the religions are based upon two deities. Now, polytheism means many gods. Most of these were simply emanations 
uh, radiating from them so there would be the lesser gods and there'd be the greater gods, but it's based upon these two. Docetism, as we've already introduced, was a word they used to say that Jesus was only an appearance. He just simply appeared because there is no such thing as tangible matter. This today is perpetuated by Christian science, unity, and other teachings uh, because they believe that matter is essentially evil. And when you believe that matter is essentially evil, you have to take one of two or three attitudes. You have to say, well, if it's evil, I'll refrain from it. You become an extreme ascetic, ascetic so that you don't believe in doing anything that you enjoy. If you like um, iced tea, you won't drink it because it's, um, it's matter and you receive joy from it and so you must become an ascetic. Or you may be as some of them to say, well, we can't help it, so let's just indulge ourselves. These people believed this. They believed also that from the two gods there were emanations and these came from the supreme being. Now, the supreme being was not Jehovah like you think of when you read about Abraham and God. The least of all was called the Demiurge, and the Demiurge was the world framer, and he's the evil God. The one who created the world was called Demiurge. They borrowed this from other religions. And this was the world framer that put it together, and because so much of the world is filled with sorrow and suffering, he had to be an evil God. They were very hostile to the Jewish religion because the Jewish religion believed in Jehovah, believed in a Jehovah that created the world. So that forced them against Judaism. You begin to see then how these sects were actually warring one with the other. They would oppose Ebionites. It was seeking for a system to explain everything. Now, if you read after a cult, they will try to explain all aspects of religious knowledge. They try to put it together. Now, for instance, the Baha'i religion is a religion that is designed to put together all religions so that they believe when they are all together and all explained, they'll make a unit that is harmonious. There are other religions that attempt to do the same thing. That's what these people were attempting to do. The man that was most esteemed then, esteemed, was not the man that knew the most. It wasn't the man that possessed the most knowledge, that had great understanding. Rather, he was the one that understood the mystery of the universe, how many angels there were, all the forces in the world. Uh, so the man that could systematize and put it together was the smartest. You see, truth cannot abide in this. We like a God that knows everything when we don't. We can depend upon him for the complexity, the difficulties, and be satisfied with the simple. Come unto me, all ye that labor and have a lady, I'll give you rest. The truth is just as simple as that. He says, come to me and I'll teach you. Another group called the Manichians that started in about 238. In other words, we're talking about a time soon after the Ebionites had ebbed away. The Gnostics still were influential, but the Manichians had an entirely different belief. They originated from the Persian uh, beliefs, a man by the name of Mani, Manichians, of Mesopotamia originated this. Somehow Christianity had formed its way little by little, sifting down through the peoples, and this man was influenced by it. He attempted to blend the oriental idea of two gods, a god of good and a god of bad, with Christianity. And after he finished with it, he had quite an exciting religion. Now, if you'll be patient, I wish to read to you exactly 18 lines from my manuscript. I hope you understand it. This illustrates 
things that we do not need to know a religion that will not benefit us. There were two kingdoms, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness. From the kingdom of light emanated mother of life, from which sprang primitive man. Now, I put quotation marks around all these because primitive man is a being, supposedly, <laughs> to oppose the powers of the kingdom of darkness. Defeated in combat, he calls to the kingdom of light for help. Though the kingdom of darkness consumed his armor, which was light, he is raised and placed in the sun. You know what I mean by the sun? That's what kept you warm today. That good old Florida sunshine. I don't mean orange juice. The sun. Sun worship was a common thing in the ancient world and still is some places. So he raised and placed him in the sun as a principle of heat and light, which is logos. Now, I'd have thought that was Jesus according to John because that's the word he used. In the beginning with the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Christ. But he has another idea. And he calls this Logos son of God, but he doesn't mean Jesus. Mixed with matter, the body. All growth in plants and animals was an attempt for stolen light to escape. So the cow goes out in the pasture, the corn grows, and the fact the cow grows in stature and the corn grows shows that light is attempting to escape from primitive man. Simple, isn't it? Stay with me. For fear that all stolen light would escape, he created man. That's us. Who would attract all stolen light to himself? And yet, with a material body, he would trap it so that man has all light in himself. Thus man, with two opposite principles, a soul like the kingdom of light and a man that has a body like the kingdom of darkness. So he has a soul that aspires to God, but he has a body that's just like an animal in many respects. All of it held or trapped light, not allowing it to escape through other channels. Christ appeared only, just an appearance. They thought they saw him, but they didn't. To help the light to overpower the evil. That had held light from ascending to the sun and provide deliverance for light from earthly bondage. Now that's a religion that you might try to understand. It's not a religion that'll help you. It'll not save your soul. It'll not help you in the hour of sorrow. It's intellectualism. This is Manichaeanism. Monarchianism is another group altogether, and really the word monarchianism doesn't fully express what they believe. Uh, it has to do with the nature of Christ. They rejected all of John's writings. That's John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John Revelation. They did accept what is called adoptionism. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses believe in adoptionism. Other groups believe in adoptionism, that when Jesus came, he came as a human being, just a man like everybody else, that he is not the eternal son of God. That would be those in the church building. Uh, they didn't have printing presses. They had to be copied by hand. It required many months to make a copy of the scriptures. Usually they had only a part of the scriptures. And of course... The Roman Empire wanted to seize all of these and they'd say, I'll kill you if you don't give up the scriptures. So they gave them up to save their lives. They called them traitors. Now it's the same thing over again. They were saying, you can't, you can't get back in the church because you're a, you're a traitor. It was a problem of what to do with these poor, weak people. I can understand how the, some of them might get weak knees, but what are you going to do with them when they come back? You say, well, we're warm-hearted, we'll accept them back. Suppose that happens three different times. It becomes a real problem. They were believers in strict church discipline. They believed that the power of, of baptism was in the water it's 
himself. Now, we indicated that last night. Some of them believe that the power of baptism was in the water, that it had a magical effect. Of course, that's materialism. It's like the Catholics believe today. Now, I think probably that is about all that we need to notice of these groups. Uh, we have simply covered briefly and given you the reasons why they existed. Now, these appeared on the scene and they passed again. Some of them contributed to the basic belief that later on would make the Catholic doctrines. You'll notice the list that we have here. Let me just give a quick reading down of this. The first four of these, the theory of Holy Spirit baptism that we just read to you about the monetists, they believe that, prophets, visions, and seasons of ecstasy. They got real excited, and I'm not against being excited if we have something to be excited about. But I'll tell you what I've seen so often. I have seen people riding the crest of emotionalism, and when emotionalism is gone or when trial comes, they lose it just like that. I've seen that so much. I preached in the north and I preached in the south and I'll tell you frankly, I'd rather preach in the south. I swear I started preaching. It's no reflection on Iowa. I, I preached here about 20 years. Good people. It's warmer down there. <laughs> For one thing, I'm kind of a cold-blooded gentleman. Uh, I've noticed one thing, however, about the south. You can get a hearing easier than you can up in the north because they're just uh, by nature uh, uh, warmer and uh, outgoing and they'll give you a hearing. I have noticed how that the charismatic people thrive there. I could give you a long history, two hours long, of people that I've learned the past four years. Fine people. A uh, gentleman came in by the name of Barry and uh, he's either up or down, you know, either hot or cold. He'd come in and he was bubbling all over. Well, he'd come in and had a long face and there wasn't a thing you could say to cheer him up. He rode the crest of emotionalism. Emotionalism should be the result of faith. Feeling comes from faith. Faith does not come from feeling. Because if faith comes from feeling and tragedy strikes you and your feelings are low, you'll lose your faith. So we're not saying that feeling is not, is not scriptural. It is. But the only two recorded instances in the New Testament where the word feeling is found is in Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 4. And in both times he's talking about the feeling of sin not the feeling of salvation. But he does talk about joy and peace and happiness. Synonyms of this. We'll see the following this. Uh, the, these doctrines that were originated by Augustine. He wrote a series of volumes called The City of God. Uh, basically the same thing as Calvinism is. Total hereditary depravity. That when babies are born, they're the very devil themselves. Now, John R. Rice used to say, if you doubt that a baby's not born in sin and is not the very devil himself or have the devil in this way he put it, have the devil in him, he said, you take that little tyke that's about a week old and you hold its head and at first it won't do a thing. But the minute it tries to squirm and turn away and uh, he feels he's trapped, well, he'll get red in the face and begin to squall and twist and carry on. And he says, that's proof that that baby has a devil in him. Well, if that's true that, 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 that uh, the devil is in him, it's also true that he's in the little kitten and the little doggy. He'll do the same thing. It's simply the instinct to survive. It doesn't prove anything. Nobody thought of this idea. It could have been proof of the Bible. No one believed it until Augustine conceived it. You know why he did? He did because of his experience. His experience was he had been a very sinful young man. He had a keen mind. He had a mother named Monica that was a fine Christian. But he was not only wayward, he was prodigal. Finally shacked up with a girl, unmarried to her, and with a child, he came to himself. And he said, I'm going to become a Christian, and he was a celibate from that time on, and he was a very fine man, make no mistake about it, let's not discredit him. He was a very fine man. He meant well. But he concluded that his experience to change him from sin to Christ was something that only God could do. It wasn't any choice of his own. So he concluded then that man had no choice in the matter. That all people are born in sin. And unless 
God helps him to change or compels him to change, he will not be changed. Now, he and later Calvin particularly developed that to say that from the foundation of the world, the destiny of every man was settled. That God in the beginning sort of played uh, a game of checkers. This one is in and this one is out. This one is in and this one is out. This one goes to heaven and this goes to hell. And of course, this takes all initiative and willpower out of the hands of people. Jesus said, whosoever will may come. He gives the salvation, but we can will to come. We have to make the decision. Following that, salvation by faith only through grace, once saved, always saved, necessity of infant baptism, naturally, because if a baby is born in sin, it's lost unless it's baptized. Of course, that had to be sprinkling soon. They didn't, they didn't dip the babies. The Greek Catholic Church still does. But uh, the Roman Catholics said, well, let's just make it simple. Let's throw some water in their face. Unconditional election and probation. Uh, then we start a list of Roman Catholic beliefs. Now, these dates that we have put on this chart are the accepted dates by the Catholic Church. I did not pick them out of thin air. They are from their writings, the accepted doctrines or beliefs. Uh, let's take just a little bit of time and show you what uh, you may have not known. I'm going to read to you tonight. A writing by the man called Cardinal Baronius in which he explains why the Catholic Church had the right to borrow rituals and doctrines from pagan religions. Listen to it. It was in his annals, year 740 A.D. It is allowable for the church to transfer to pious uses those ceremonies which the pagans employed impiously. Now, the pagans, of course, used these ideas, such as burning candles and incense and the habits of the priests facing east. All of these they used impiously or impiously. He said, from superstition to worship, we are able to change them after they have been purified by consecration. So all you have to do is bring in a pagan doctrine and sanctify it and consecrate it and then do it for God. Uh, it's very interesting, his remark for this justification. For the devil is more mortified to see those things return to the service of Jesus Christ which were instituted for his own that the devil is more mortified to see things that he instituted for himself in paganism, sanctified and done to the glory of God. Now, you can sanctify anything by that rule. These are doctrines, are beliefs that the Old Testament not only condemned, but God pronounced a death penalty upon the Jews who practiced these very doctrines doctrines of four pagan groups, Egyptian mysticism, Greek philosophy, Roman religion, plus the Jewish religion and their customs. You begin to examine Catholicism, you'll find very few beliefs about what they have originated from paganism. Things that you might normally say, well, you know, that's just a common thing, like sprinkling babies or adults. They borrowed that from paganism because they did that. Not that they could read it in the Bible. But you see, Christianity came in 100, that is, from 30 AD to 100, 70 years. And as people were converted from paganism, unless they were taught thoroughly, it would only be natural for them to bring their ideas to Christianity. And enough of those brought their ideas until it corrupted Christianity. 
Let's then take just a little look at several of these tonight. The length is too long. How do the Catholics explain the sacraments of the priest? The sacraments of the priest. How many have attended a high mass? Not just mass, but a high mass. Okay. Now, when I taught here in Ottumwa, many years on Christmas Eve, there are only seven in a year, on Christmas Eve, I would take students to St. Mary's, and we would sit there and watch the Mass. I would tell the students, watch carefully what they do. I had a book of their prayers in English. The whole procedure. Uh, nearly everything they did could not be found in the lids of the Bible. Almost 100%. Found in paganism, yes. Originated from paganism. Now, the priest had certain things that he said in Latin. They are changing it to the vernacular now in most countries, but they were said in Latin. But whether said in Latin or German or English, they believe it has to be said 100% like it has been written and authorized, or if they have 500 people in that mass, it'll do none, none of them any good. Okay, let's read it and see. In the year 1439, just prior to the Council of Trent, this is the big one down here that finally decided and stabilized their beliefs. There was a lot of opposition raised because in two prior councils, they said, let's be lenient. After all, if a priest, in those days, they weren't too well educated, uh, they're speaking Latin and maybe they're French and they don't understand too much and they'll make some mistakes, they'll goof. So let's just decide that, that God will be pleased if they intend to do well. Now that happened twice, but now they decided another way. They had a council of Florence and they said no word is said of it until the council of Trent ordered the sacraments valid only if in correct form. Only if in correct form. Catholics believe that to be valid, the priest has to say them as they have been written and authorized. Otherwise, it does the people no good. They believe in ringing bells. Now, pagans have been ringing bells for a long time. Ancient idolaters practiced this. You can read it in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19 and throughout secular history. Now let all the people before the Christian era, that is the religious people, would practice the ringing of bells. Now usually that was to shoo the devil out or the evil spirits or whatever they believed in, to ring the bells. Sometimes it was to attract attention or to call the people to do certain things. During the period of Augustus, the pagans built temples so that the chair and the priest faced the east. Now, if you've ever been in, a, in, in, the, in the mass, you'll notice that the ringing of the bell is supposed to uh, call the people to worship the host. Now, in the process, the priest faces the east. And... Almost without exception, the Catholic churches have been built so that the priest faces the east. St. Mary's does. Some of them are set on an angle, but until last several years, the churches were not so built. And there is a reason why. They are stating here, let those sacrifice toward the altars look to the east of the heavens, as also the statue which is to stand in the temple, for it is necessary that the altars of God be turned to the east. Now, in the year of 443, Leo I ordered Christians to face the west. I'm going to contrast this. This is before the practice started. Do you know why? Because he said the pagans face the east, and we're not pagans. You face the west. But as time went by, they borrowed it. And instead of facing the West, 
to be opposite or unlike the pagans, they started facing the east to be like them. Infant baptism is interesting, but it's quite lengthy. Praying for the dead. Catholics pray for the dead. Uh, John says that we should pray, but don't pray for any man that sins unto death or until death. Don't pray for him. There's no point when a man reaches death to pray for him. That's precisely what he said in 1 John chapter 5. The Greeks celebrated the memory of their warriors, their heroes, in their tombs for the purpose of exciting emulation or an example. Now, they would have great warriors to fight on the battlefield, and they were slain, and they buried them with pomp. And every year, they would go to the tombs, and they would worship these, do obeisance to them. And that, of course, was to show that here was a hero. Let the other lads be as heroic. By the close of the second century, that church had been greatly persecuted, many of them slain. And so what they did, the Christians, was to emulate the Greeks. They didn't worship them. They didn't pray to them at this point. But they simply went to the funeral, and later they would go to the tombs, and they would pay them honors in respect to the fact that here are saints that died for Christ. Nothing wrong with that. I suppose we'd do the same thing if some people had to give their lives for Christ and we greatly respected it, we'd lay a wreath on their tomb or flowers. we do it with our relatives. But that's not worship, worshiping them or praying to them. The purpose of these services, of course, were understandable with the Christians. However, in time, they started praying to them. Uh, and they were supposed to help them. Thus, this became uh, praying to them as groups called saints. And these people then were supposed to do them a favor. Uh, this covered several centuries of time, but today they have a group called saints. And this is called the, con uh, the invocation of the saints, invoking them to do favors for them. They believe that those that are named saints, those that have lived good lives and lived long enough to forget any meanness uh, and have had some miracles performed by them when they were alive or when they died by a suit of clothes or a dress or uh, an old shoe. And these miracles would show that God wanted them to be a saint, and when they were canonized as a saint, then the saints are to pray to these saints. All Catholics pray to these. They have one day that's called All Saints Day. Now, they pray to the saints to do for them the same thing that you pray to God to do for you. They believe the saints can do it. They believe that in heaven there is a great depository of virtue of goodness, of righteousness. And it is possible for us to add to it. Now, the man who is an ascetic, uh, who deprives himself of much of this life, he has good deeds, and those good deeds go into this big depository. And when Jesus died, he put an immense amount of goodness in that depository. So that when you or I have done a little meanness and we need some grace, we pray to the saint and to Mary, and they reach in there and give it to us. Do you think that's far-fetched? In no way. That's what they believe. We're going to sing shortly a song talking about the blood of Christ. They do not believe that the blood of Christ is that which gives us righteousness. This comes from the great depository. It does not come from the crucified one. That's why they invoke the saints. The saints can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Confession of sins, called auricular confession. 
was practiced by the pagans. The ancient Babylonians demanded a secret confession by their pagan priests. Naturally, they didn't want it to be a public confession because here's a priest to say, well, I stole a, a sheep from this man and I lied and so forth. Uh, he was to make a secret confession, but it was a practice. And it became a practice among the pagans to have priests that lived separate apart from the people. That put them on a pedestal. They were to make confessions, but they were to make confessions secretly. And of course, the people made the confessions to the priest. The fourth Lateran Council, which was in 1215, first authoritatively demanded all people to confess their sins to the priest. I've been in the Catholic churches in Puerto Rico. It's very interesting to go to those. First time I went to Ponce, we went into the great Catholic church. And I had not examined the inside of the confessional boxes before, but uh, I had read a lot about the confessional boxes. Um, they have a little hole, and you could talk through that hole. Uh, the priest puts his ear up there, and you're supposed to confess your sins. But it became notorious there. It was notorious, as it is in most lands. Oftentimes a priest was hearing of immoral actions from a girl, and he brought her up. Do you realize that the Catholic priest has all power of absolution? So that when you confess your sin to the ear of the priest, he determines what penance you must do, what kind of payment. You may have to say prayers so often, you may have to get so much money, you may have to go out food so much, in order for you to have forgiveness. You know that the Catholics teach that if the priest doesn't absolve you, you just ain't absolved. Pardon the slang, it's true. You're not absolved. No way! It depends upon the whim of a priest. And a practice there has been practiced a long time. If the priest is on the immoral side and he hears a confession from a girl, I'll absolve you if you give me what I want. This is not, un this is not unusual. It's a common practice. I realize all Catholics don't believe this. There was a girl at Joppa's half-sister. Joppa Perez's half-sister was going to the university there. Uh, Joppa gave her a chart, church history chart. She took it to that university where this church is located. Gave it to the priest. And she gave it, he gave it back to her and said, I want you to renounce this. Tear it up and throw it away. Said, I just want you to explain what's wrong with it. He said, I tell you, you'll be expelled from the campus if you don't throw that away. But she said, I just want to explain. She's a Catholic. I want to explain why it's wrong, why these doctrines are taught. She was expelled from the campus. She didn't want to throw it away because she believed it was right. These doctrines have originated, been perpetuated. There are about 40 different doctrines, most of them listed here. They have come from paganism. They have been taught eventually as doctrines of God. People live by them as though God taught these doctrines. These are not the teachings of Christ. We have the good book that gives us all truth. Tonight we're going to sing uh, this great song, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're going to sing the first three stanzas, please, while we're staying. What can wash away my sins? 